Many thanks to Pushkin House for providing us with this uh, impressive platform to discuss affairs which I suspect may be of interest solely to ourselves. And also many thanks to the audience who, with the kind intention of supporting Pushkin House, this systemed cultural institution, have come to listen to this shop talking. Uh, because actually dissecting the current state of Russian political regime is not an uplifting uh, discussion. And there are many better ways of spending this very sunny uh, evening. So many thanks to you for having come. But really, we have many things to uh, discuss with uh, dear comrade Mark. Uh, we haven't met for some time. And although I'm an avid listener of your podcast in Moscow Shadows, yes. A very I, fine podcast. A, a, very, a very good one indeed. And it, it's short to the purpose. It comes uh, at regular intervals, which is also an advantage. And it deals with with matters of engrossing interest, like uh, Russian secret services, the military, organized crime, um, such like entertaining uh, matters. So, as you may suspect, we do have something to talk about. Uh, one, one of the books that, one of the many books you authored that have been mentioned uh, is called We Need to Talk About Putin. Um, I suspect that by now we need to talk about the system rather than the person. We need to evaluate, at least to try to evaluate, the current status of the system. Is it still up and running, alive and kicking? Is it functional? Which parts of it are functional? And thanks to what? For how long may it carry on yet? What is the degree of dysfunctionality that it has reached, if it has reached any degree of dysfunctionality? These are the questions that I'm keeping, that I keep asking myself, and which I would very much want to uh, ask you as well. But first and foremost, what do you think of today's um, Chechen affair? What is the health of uh, Adam Delimhanov, whom I care about because he's a member of the State Duma, you know, a valuable a part of our legislative process, so I do hope he will be well. For those of you who may not know about Adam Delimhanov, I mean, he is the genuine man with the golden gun, in that he actually has a gold-plated Makarov pistol that was presented to him. Um, he's also... I hesitate to say Ramzan Kadyrov's vicar on earth, but I mean, he is in effect Kadyrov's representative in, in, in Moscow. He is the senator for Chechnya. Um, from time to time, he also has people murdered or actually does the murdering himself, because after all, we all like someone who, you know, works with his hands, um, in, in, including in the, in the United Arab Emirates, for, for where he was still, I think, wanted for murder. For those people who haven't heard this story, um, Kadyrov himself, who, after all, spends as much time on social media as he does actually governing Chechnya, um, put out a, a request to the Ukrainian secret services, saying, I, 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 I don't know where Adam Delmkanov is. Um, can you tell me which locations you have hit recently with artillery fire so that I can know if he's all right or not? Now, I have not heard if there's been a reply did, 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 did they set to help him out? Uh, well, what I have heard was this. Um, Vyacheslav Valodin, the speaker of the Russian State Duma, uh, told people that he has spoken to Delimhanov and he's alive and well. But the speaker of the State Duma is the person who's been affirming that Vladimir Zhirinovsky is alive and well for about a month. <laughs> after he has apparently been dead. So that may not be entirely trustworthy. Sorry to say this about any parliamentary member. Um, the next post by um, Kadyrov95, which is his name on Telegram, was that it was some kind of joke uh, aimed at, I don't know, trolling Ukrainian media, seeing how fast they will jump at a fake bit of news, and it had a picture presenting some people sitting on a field, I don't know what that means, but no video, no nothing, and I very much doubt the joke part of it. You were telling in, I think, a couple of your last postcard episodes about how careful uh, Ramzan is of his people and how very unenthusiastic he is and has been of their being engaged in actual Ukrainian warfare because 
which is very natural, he needs them to serve himself and to guard Chechnya rather than to um, lose their heads at somewhere around Bakhmut. So this episode of today, it is not clear to me at all. And of course, we are in the fog of war for the most part of it. So I wouldn't vote for anyone being either alive or, or dead. What is this phrase? Some say that Mazarini is alive, some that he's dead, but I don't believe either. Uh, yes, I think it was the phrase from the memoirs of, of this also very picturesque era. So, so he may well be kind of Schrodinger's Chechen. Um, at present, he's alive or dead until, until someone opens the box and finds him in it. But, I mean, I was thinking about this, and, and of course, the first thing that comes to mind when, when, when thinking about the contemporary military affairs is, of course, the, the medieval crusading order of the Teutonic Knights. Um, let me explain why. In some ways, they had a brilliant business model. Um, they were launching their crusades across the Balti along the Baltic coast into what was now the Baltic states and in due course into Russia, famously um, then encountering Alexander Nevsky. But their business model was brilliant. It was that essentially they had kind of combined crusades with Club 18 to 30. In that, you know, you were, you were a medieval knight and you wanted either the prestige or the... Um, holy sanction of going on crusade, but actually going all the way to the Holy Land was a pain in the ass. It took a long time. It was dangerous. I mean, the Saracens were, were, were tough. So what you could do instead is you pay the Teutonic Knights, you'd go to one of their castles, you would feast, and then you'd go on a raid against usually the Lithuanians, last pagans of Europe, um, you, you, you kill a few in the name of, of, of Jesus the Compassionate. Um, and then you go home and you say, that's it, job done. I've done my crusading. And I can't help that we've seen a steady little stream of Chechens popping into Ukraine just long enough to kind of punch their card. Um, get some Instagram photos of themselves TikTok. in full military TikTok kit. TikTok videos. Or TikTok videos, indeed. I, I stand corrected. I'm... I'm not hip with the kids um, and, 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 and their social media. And I, and I wonder if, if, if this was, was what Delhi Mikhailov was doing. Because again, this is the interesting thing that you have, to bring this out to a quite sort of broader level, fascinated though, though it is always to talk about the Chechens. Um, on the one hand, you have this incredibly personalistic regime in Chechnya for Chechens. You know, people wanting to sort of present themselves as the archetype of Chechen manliness even while staying damn safe and living in the presidential hotel in Moscow and, and, and such like. Um, but on the other hand, you have a kind of a separate hyper-personalistic regime in Moscow. Um, and a lot of this is about cosplaying loyalty. I mean, even while the Chechens don't actually fight much in, in Ukraine, they want to give that impression that, my God, we're out, and if, if, only, if only Putin would let us go, we would sort it all out. If only, just you know, hold me back, or whatever. I mean, is this just a Chechen thing, or, are, or do you think other Russians are, are trying to find ways of saying, if only, I, I mean, I, 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 I'd be there? Well, uh, you know, they say that this othering thing, presenting somebody as exotic and different, is actually the way to project your own nature on a blank wall and distance yourself from it. I also cannot help thinking sometimes that this picture presented by the official Russian media and Russian official speakers of the Ukrainian regime, the one totally corrupt, um, selling its country to the West, ready to run away at the slightest provocation, only making a show in order to get more money from, in this case, the West, but really all being made of window dressing. Whether it's not also some kind of othering thing, some kind of projection. But coming back for the moment to the personalistic regime and their armed forces, um, if Adam Delimhanov was really hit he was supposed to be hit immediately after the Ahmad Battalion has signed a contract with the Minister of Defense and declared their readiness to defend Belgorod region, the much suffering Belgorod region. And we remember that before, before this, uh, it was Wagner that announced the same 
determination. But Wagner refused to sign this contract. And actually, the owner and head of Wagner is now publicly refuting the orders of the president, not just of the uh, minister of defense, but of the supreme commander. And at the same time, when this supposed joke about a group of Chechens being hit was aired on social media, there was another story posted by some of the Z bloggers and then deleted that it was Prigozhin who leaked the whereabouts of this group of people to the Ukrainians. We are by no means even attempting to get to the truth of the matter because it doesn't matter much actually who hit whom and who leaked what. Because what we are seeing is, well frankly, a militarized chaos. It does not look like regular warfare to me, but then maybe I'm not an expert. So the question is, does any war look that messy at close quarters? And are we just witnessing the effect of the magnifying effect of social media in particular and information age in general? Or are we witnessing the actual erosion of the, well, state monopoly on legal violence? Does it look like any war with peculiarities to you? Or does it look like a deterioration of the state power machine? I, I, I'm going to give the unfortunate answer of neither. No, this is not a, like any other war. I wouldn't necessarily frame it simply as a deterioration of the state's control over the monopoly of violence, because often the, that control is not that it necessarily does the violence, but it gets to decide who does the violence. You often outsource your, 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 your thuggery and warfare. But can you then call the, the hounds of the war back? When, when what is control then? Well, I mean, in that situation, look, I mean, Putin could have Prigozhin arrested tomorrow. Really? Who I is think the arresting? Oh, I can imagine that. Alexander Ivanovich Bastrykin coming with a warrant. There would be a very long line of people who would happily arrest Prigozhin. I mean, the FSB already are putting pressure, the military police. No, I mean, that, that can be done. But it's more that I think well, the reason I see for this extraordinary dysfunctionality on the battlefield is because what we're actually seeing is an export of the Putin system into warfare. You know, for 23 years, and in political terms, relatively successfully, Putin created this system of constant uh, squabbling, overlapping interests and individuals with, with competing views and competing financial in, in empires so that they were busy horizontally squabbling, leaving him in the position of the final arbiter that he could then resolve the disputes whenever he wanted. Even the, the, the spooks, the, you know, the old Sidovic wars, you know, sort of took place. The problem is that that's a system that therefore becomes entirely dependent on Putin's capacity and will to actually resolve these disputes when they become problematic. But also, what happens is then the system gets exported. So you have the regular military, you have the National Guard, you have the Chechens, you have Prigozhin and Wagner, you have other military groups and so forth, all of whom are meant to be under Gerasimov as overall force commander. In practice, they're not, except for the regular military. But the point is, this is a system in which only one person can knock heads together. There's only one person who could actually say to Prigozhin, you do what Gerasimov says, or I will have you arrested or liquidated. And he's clearly not able or willing to do that. So, I mean, I think that this is, I mean, there is karma at work here. I mean, Putinism is great at doing anything but actually fighting wars, it seems, even though war fighting and the machismo around it has been so central to Putin's kind of whole shtick. Um, but Putin himself is unable, unwilling, too cowardly, whatever, to actually do his job and, and force people into, into a sort of single unified whole because that would be admitting that your system is dysfunctional in the extreme, I would say. I mean, but also, it, it, it requires Putin to be there. I mean, this is the thing that, 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 that I'm wondering, is actually how absent Putin has been. He's I mean, just been you... talking to the so-called war correspondents for like two hours. Yeah, I mean, because he had to do that, and I mean, and that was a way of softballing at, questions. At one, at, on one level, they were providing the, the usual fulsome uh, loyalty thing. At the other, they were kind of irrespective. <laughs> 
at times, especially when he told them this story about General Lapin uh, with a gun in his hand, stabilnym оружием. That's an important point, that it was stabilnym оружием, his, his uh, regular gun, not, not some random gun, uh, encouraging the troops. And then one of this, the young guys, uh, this, this military blogger said, yes, we were all watching with bated breath. And, well, you know, I'm, I've been a bureaucrat for many years of my happy youth. Once a bureaucrat, always a bureaucrat. I'm getting surprised when I see things like that. No one did this to Yeltsin. <laughs> no one did this to Putin previously. But, but he was also, I mean, almost, put, uh, it was actually a little embarrassing because Putin was almost trying to kind of almost joke along and, and be one of the guys and... He was doing so with every bit of... I mean, he was doing it as conv convincingly as that time we saw Dmitry Medvedev in a leather jacket. Um, <laughs> some things just don't work. You have no pity. <laughs> <sighs> ah, ah, poor, poor country. So, so, so yeah. why, why, why do you feel then that, 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 that precisely that they were being disrespectful this time? Well, what I'm seeing coming back a few steps to this erosion of legal monopoly on violence. Uh, what I'm seeing is uh, a number of attempts on the part of Minister of Defense to bring this whole thing into order, attempts manifesting themselves in their proposing legislative measures. You may have heard the last one, I have mentioned it, uh, ordering, well, we haven't seen the order, but it was spoken by the Deputy Minister of Defense that all the volunteer battalions, uh, the word private military companies were not used because they are not legal in Russia, but volunteers, they have to sign contracts with the Minister of Defense. By the way, I'm not sure that's a very good timing because in the time of counteroffensive, to engage people in so much paperwork may not be the best thing, but the intention, I could not help applauding. Uh, even if taken not in the best of times. So, this is one thing that they're trying to do. Second, they have stopped Wagner from recruiting convicts and have tried to take this thing on themselves. They have introduced legislative changes which allows, if not convicts, to be recruited. That is, of course, impossible, but people under trial to sign uh, a military contract instead and and go and kill a few Ukrainians and be killed themselves rather than serving a term. So. If preserving this monopoly, and we may not go into too much detail as to what this monopoly consists of, whether in doing actual violence or ordering it to be done or stopping it from being perpetuated when you need it stop. But there is a sense that this monopoly is absolutely essential to the nature of statehood. Not to democracy or liberalism or rights of man or whatever, but just to the functionality of the state itself. And this is instinctively felt even by people and groups who do not know these words. So I see that the, at least the Minister of Defense is trying to kind of collect all these spilled ban beans back into some sort of form. I do not see any sympathy for this work from anyone else, and Prigozhin is openly laughing at it. I can hear the president trying to support the Minister of Defense, but in very, very mild terms. During this meeting with the war correspondents, he said, he was asked about this contract thing, and he said, yes, this needs to be done so that the volunteers can have social guarantees. So it's for your own good, so that you can have pensions and discounts on, on your housing tariff payments, etc. All very important things, certainly. Um, so he, he was on the side of the regulars, as he has to be, because he represents the regular forces, not the regular. He's the president. He should be, his legitimacy should be based on what Max Weber called the procedural, the rational, or the bureaucratic, rather than charismatic or traditional. So he needs to be supporting the regular forces, but his support seems to be rather half-hearted and so far not that effectual. You have mentioned that it's a paradox that the system basing itself on its machismo is not very good at doing the actual warfare. It was and remains a system mostly based on imitation, make-believe, hypocrisy, and lip service. It has lived for almost a quarter of a century with a moderate to high success. Success at least in 
getting to and getting the thing which is at the heart of all autocracies, preserving power, preserving resources, relocating and allocating those resources among the elites. They have been good at that, but have they really eat the system? Has it overstepped its part in engaging in an actual war with a comparably sized and comparably strong neighbor, rather than in special operations of the kind we saw in 2008 and 2014? That is actually the, the, the question of questions. Maybe I can imagine them succeeding in bringing back the monopoly, getting rid of Prigozhin, absorbing his people into the system, recreating some sort of order, maybe on the battlefield, maybe, which is more important for them inside of the country. I can imagine that. It is still a possibility. But what I'm seeing is certainly a deterioration. I think that we used to say that the inertial scenario is the most likely one. That things will more or less go on as they are. But now that I'm looking at things, I think our inertial scenario is now the deteriorating scenario, the scenario of degeneration, of gradual weakening. It may be fast or it may be slow. Again, it may be gradual or sharp, but still, I think, well, again, I can imagine other, other scenarios, but this seems to me the most likely one. So your question was about where is the person in the personalist autocracy? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I do not like to indulge in this personalistic analysis uh, about talking about anybody's state of health or the state of morale, but there's a thing or two I have noticed as well. You remember in the end of 2022, all the regular events involving the president were canceled. We did not have the um, Federal Assembly address, uh, the so-called hotline, where the president talks to his people and hands out gifts. Uh, we didn't have the big press conference, and even less publicly, but still even more surprisingly for my bureaucratic soul, he did not chair the final um, governmental meeting of the year, which is a custom. It has always been like that. And he didn't turn up at the, um, uh, what was the name of this hockey team? Uh, they play at night. Uh, night they, had, they had to have a tournament of sorts on the Red Square, also close to the end of the year, and he missed that as well. So. He was not there. Happily, he managed to pull himself together and uh, congratulate the people on the new year. That was also done in a rather irregular way. He was standing against the background of some people in uniform, whoever these were. Uh, some of them are dead by this time, by the way. Some of them, they were FSO guys. Some of them were from actual military. Some have already been killed. Uh, but otherwise, all, the, all his regular appearances disappeared. But he made, in the very end of December, one short press talking to the press. It was just a few questions solely from Russian state media, and there was one question from, I think, Ria Novosti. Mm. Well, dear Vladimir Vladimirovich, how are things going with Ukraine? And he started on his usual diatribe about, you know, that you all have heard it about five times every week we hear it. Uh, so about um, the West and the Anglo-Saxons and the brotherly nation, etc., etc. But then there was this twist, which I paid attention to. I can listen to this, but I can read the transcripts. Everyone has their sensitivities. I can read, I think, anything written by, by a human, and some even written by a GPT chat. But uh, I'm not equal to actually listening and, and looking. Uh, so. Um, he said, we supposed that the fact of our being one nation is so self-evident that truth and fairness will prevail because it's inevitable. But unfortunately, uh, they, some they, uh, have succeeded at first making us quarrel or literally setting us apart and then setting us to fight against each other. In this sense, he said, they have succeeded, and we have experienced a fiasco. Мы потерпели фиаско. 
when I have read it in the Kremlin Rouge site. I even made a search about his use of this specific word, fiasco. He used it like, about four or five times in the course of his recorded career, but always in regards to them. Our adversaries, uh, people setting up sanctions, etc., etc., they have any peterpere fiasco. But now it was us. So it was this moment of loss of spirit, evidently. Then, in the beginning of 2023, he kind of rallied up, seemed to be more optimistic, more, by, what, what's the term? Well, more alive, let's put it this way. But now I think we have another of these downward moments. This may not mean much. He may survive in this manner for another 10 years. That is not impossible at all. Look at Silvio, friend Silvio. Yeah. An example to all of us. Uh, but coming back to your question about the person in this very personalist regime, of course, one of the chief functions of the president is to preserve this equilibrium, to be the arbiter of intra elite disputes. If he fails to do that, then, by the way, then what? Well, I think it's going to become a, a systemic challenge. I mean, look, the thing is that, I mean, yes, of course, we, we, we don't know about Vladimir Vladimirovich's health, and, and of course, we, we, we all wish it the very best. Um, <laughs> sadly, as I understand it, I mean, people who have the resources um, to sort of pour over every bit of footage and have multiple doctors looking at it, they don't seem to think that whatever he's got is something that is soon to be fatal or, or um, incapacitating, merely just temporarily so, perhaps. Um, so it's not so much that, that it's, it's just simply that, that you know, when, when the man in the center is, doing, is not doing his job, as, as Putin manifestly is not, at the moment. I mean, he's, he's doing things he shouldn't be doing, such as micromanaging the war effort. Um, still hasn't learned the lesson that Stalin learned much more quickly, which is let the generals do the generaling rather than anything else. But he's not resolving these inter disputes, which is not just, I mean, Prigozhin and Shoigu is the, the, the marquee event, but there are lots more. If you look at, for example, the whole issue about the partition of, of Yandex and such like, I mean, there are lots of, lots of disputes going on that, that basically Putin is not really doing anything about. Kudrin is not really able at the moment to seal the deal over Yandex, for example, because he, need, he lacks the firepower. This is um, a system in which actually it's quite dangerous to try and usurp the but power. But hasn't of he been doing it for years? Isn't he in the habit of disappearing whenever something unpleasant crops up? Yeah, but the point is that because the unpleasant thing is, is something that is relatively short lived. This is not short lived and this is not going to be short lived. I mean, this war. You know, fine, it will be, it will be lovely if, if this war ended soon. I don't actually see that happening. But what if he sits tight till 2024 and then uh, Donald the Saviour comes and, and saves Russia? Well, apart from the fact that, that um, Donald the Saviour, you know, obviously on, on whom... <laughs> likewise, we, 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 all, we all think of his health with, 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 with deep, deep care. Um, if one looks at his first presidency, I mean, for all his fine words about Putin, and let's be honest, this is a man who never met an autocrat he didn't like. Um, but in <laughs> practice, Russia policy at the end of his term was tougher than it had been at any point since 1991, because Congress was essentially running Russia policy. Um, and I, I think it's highly unlikely that that, that would be any different. I mean, although Putin may well think that... I mean, again, go, going, going back to his uh, conversation with the Roy and Corey to, you know, the other day... He very much framed it as, well, the Europeans are beginning to realize that they're just being taken for a ride by the Americans, but the Americans don't give them a choice, whatever. I mean, you know, as, as we all know, NATO is just nothing more than America's Warsaw Pact. And so, fine, he may believe that, but that's actually not, not what's likely to happen. And therefore, I think the, the problem is that if he really thinks that he can hide away from all the bad stuff, which he does, clearly, this is not a man who likes making tough decisions. He puts them off as far as possible, usually to the point where it's too and late. And so many times it served his turn. Yeah, but the, exactly, but in a, in a way, if you think about it, look, the three, I would suggest that the three key pillars on which this system has, has resided has been the, the legitimacy of both Putin and his system, control of the coercive apparatus, and
and large amounts of money to throw at problems that arise. Now, the point is, it's not like Putin not resolving these disputes mean that suddenly revolution in and of itself emerges or similar. But it, it, it basically means the system is increasingly dysfunctional. People like Mishustin, Mishustin sounds as if I'm being drunk, um, are you know, trying to fill the gap, but there's a limit to what they can do. So Putin's own legitimacy and the legitimacy of the system begins to d decay because it's, it's really been based on, as you say, a certain amount of make-believe, and it's harder to maintain the make-believe. Coercive apparatus, there, there are signs of a certain degree of, of cracks within that. Again, no one's going to break them apart. Gorgian, what, what are these? What do you mean? The coercive apparatus? The FSB, the, the police, signs. the National Guard. And so, oh, yeah. no, I mean, if you look at, take, take the National Guard which is the force that really is designed to control the streets in case of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, because Ukraine wasn't a real country and that the special military operation was really going to be more a job of pacification than actually outright warfare, large number of National Guard were, were in that initial invasion force. Got chewed apart very, very seriously when it actually turned out that for some reason the Ukrainians had a different notion of what, what their nation was going to be. And if one looks at, for example, the, the, the conversation in National Guard social media channels and so forth, you know, they, are, they are angry. They feel that they were betrayed and used as cannon fodder. And it, it, it's fair enough, because they were betrayed and they were used as cannon fodder. Um, now, again, none of this necessarily means that they're going to turn against the Kremlin or they're going to refuse their orders necessarily. But it means that I think one can say that the control over the apparatus is security apparatus is less certain than it's been at any point that I can think of in the last 23 years. And then finally, the money. There is less money. There will continue to be less money available to throw a problems. So long as someone buys our oil and gas, there will be money. There will be money, but I mean, look, for the next year, the Russian state can afford this war, sure. Mm -hmm. Probably the year after, but, the, but that's that other year, it, they will have to have made much, much tougher prioritization choices. And then come the uh, American presidential elections. Because I can sense that this is their plan. Oh, their plan, unfortunately, the universe may not be in accord. I mean, I, I agree with you entirely. I mean, what, all they've got, because I mean, in a way, that's all they've got. They're not winning on the battlefield. They're not going to win on the battlefield. Um, even some mass mobilization at this stage. Fine, you could get half a million men. And what are you going to arm them with? Shovels. I mean, there just isn't the materiel. There aren't the people to train them and so forth. This is not the great patriotic war. Um, if they're not going to win on the battlefield, the only way they can win is politically. And that means basically outlasting the Ukrainian will and capacity to resist, but more to the point, the West's will and capacity to support them. Um, now, I'm not convinced that that is in jeopardy at this stage. But I can absolutely see how, from Putin's point of view, convinced that anyway the West is the attention deficit disorder society. That we are absolutely obsessed with. This is the important problem with climate change or whatever. And this is the thing, oh, shiny, something else comes along. <laughs> and, and, and we immediately sort of pivot to that. That there's going to be trouble in you know, Taiwan or North Africa or, or whatever. Or just simply economic problems at home. Because that's what happened with Syria on top of the Crimean affair. Yeah. This is what saved um, the regime from undue attention to the annexation because suddenly everyone was occupied with Syria. Of course, so certainly this is, this is I think so this is the plan. Every, for every of these assumptions, there's a precedent, or even a few precedents, when this very tactic succeeded in carrying the system through some crisis or other. This is how it has been evolving, again, for almost the quarter of a century. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Our whole question centers on one thing, whether this situation is entirely new and these old tricks would not serve in this new situation, or it's just a larger, more bloody, but basically the same situation. I tend to think that it is a new situation, that it was one thing that the system should not have done, one step it should not have taken. It reminds one of the habitual plot in fairy tales or Pushkin's story, Pika Adama. You do something thrice, you succeed, but then one more time and you fail. You overstretch your luck. 
I'm not sure that actual history runs in such symbolic uh, plots, but again, for, for the moment, this is, this is my impression. I'm not sure about your cracks and um, dysfunctionality of command in the military and law enforcement apparatus, except in case of Prigozhin and the Minister of Defense. And it's a pretty big case. So we have Minister of Defense, we have the uh, Chechen forces, and we have Wagner all squabbling with each other, changing loyalties, because uh, this um, Ahmad uh, and then Wagner, they were calling each other brothers in caps lock just a few weeks ago, and now they're calling each other a lot of other things. Uh, not in also caps in lock. caps lock sometimes. Uh, yeah. And sometimes also in caps lock, yes. Right. Right. Uh, which, which I think it was in, in uh, uh, Oscar Wilde, the importance of being earnest only about, we'll call each other sisters. Uh, we, women only do that after they have called each other a lot of other things first. So in case of manly man, it's the other way around. They call each other brothers first and a lot of other things afterwards. Um, but otherwise, um, the FSB is in place doing its FSB thing. The police is in place. You, I agree uh, about the mystery of uh, National Guard, of Rosgvardia. I was particularly wondering about their absence from Belgrade, because this is their thing, the very thing that is written in, in their job description. This is what they ought to do, because if you have a terrorist act, an extremist violent act, uh, or some disruption uh, in, in, well, the Russian Federation, the disruption of order, then you send Amon and Sober there and sort things out. But they were not even mentioned. There was just this poor man, Gladkov, all alone on the scene. I always think of him as one of the most unfortunate people in Russia at the moment, uh, because can you imagine what, what he possibly was picturing to himself when he was taking over this Belgrade region, this rich, conservative, orthodox, blooming, agricultural district, uh, previously had it for more than 20 years by a governor who was pretty good at his job until he went batshit crazy and started seeing actual saints, angels, and such like. Uh, you may not have read his book. I haven't, but I have read extracts, so he's absolutely again off his rail. So on contrast, the young technocrat coming over to take the reins looked just brilliant and it was an easy thing for him to win over the hearts of the Belgorod people, Belgorodsov. Uh, and everything was going on swimmingly. And what, look at him now. Now we, we shall have a long and sad pause in this audience in order to uh, somehow awaken your hearts in, in pity for, for the governor Gladkov. Uh, by the way, it's another interesting uh, point, this um, new re-emergence of, of the importance of governors. It, it is very much like what happened during pandemic. Generally, the policies of managing, of administrating the war bear an uncanny resemblance to administrating the pandemic. But, well, virus was also an implacable enemy and the one you cannot um, have peace talks with, but I'm not sure that there's that much resemblance logistically and administratively between a pandemic and a full-scale war. No, but the resemblance is precisely that it's a scary and entirely unpredictable challenge. One that, until it's solved, someone like Putin does not want to be anywhere near. And again, you know, what we saw, as you say, in the, in the mm -hmm. pandemic was basically the, the, the federal center saying, well, look, you know, we'll, we'll claim the credit for, for vaccines and things, um, the, 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 the kinjal of, of, of the medical world. But on the other hand, you know, all, all the tough decisions and, and so forth, the, 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 um, the things that are gonna get people annoyed, whether it's in terms of addressing businesses or curfews and whatever else, Eh, that, that really has regional specifics, and therefore governors can, can, can be the ones to do that. But again, you see, I mean, and, 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 that, and that was actually, I mean, in some cases it, it worked well, in some cases it did not work well. Um, but what it actually said was something about the failure of the federal center, and that really means Putin. And I think this, for me, this is an interesting thing, because exactly, I think this even if the war ends soon, and frankly, let, let, let's be absolutely clear about this, even if every single square centimeter of occupied territory is freed of Russian troops, that does not end the war. That merely moves the front line to the national border. 
end of the war is something else that is unfortunately well over the horizon. But the, these pressures will, will continue and probably the governors will, will continue to have to be the sort of bad cops of, 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 of the system. I can't help think back to late Soviet times, particularly to late Brezhnevism, where increasingly actually what one got with these kind of corrupt local cabals, Uzbekistan being the most egregious, but you know, often on, on a much smaller basis, that you know, people began to think, look, Moscow, Moscow is the problem. So what we'll do is we'll try and keep as many resources as we can here. We will lie to Moscow enthusiastically about how wonderfully everything's going and we're meeting the plan and so forth. We will fudge all the figures and we'll basically, we'll live as good a life as we can, but we'll create these little kind of cabals that are in a way subversive. Not because that's the intent, but just simply because the effect is subversive. I mean, I can't help but wonder if that's the sort of the way that, that, that Russia may well go. And again, let, let me sort of drag this back to my, 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 my favourite guys, in other words, the, the, the fascist um, stormtroopers of the state, in this case the FSB. Federal Security Service used to rotate its personnel a lot. So if you were a smart provincial FSB officer, you had a decent chance of getting to St. Petersburg and Moscow, which are the kind of the plum positions. That's become so much less of a factor in the last five, ten years. Why? because basically the people in Moscow actually want to keep the plum jobs for their client base, which tend to be their kids, their friends' kids, you know, all that. So now, you know, if, if you are a, a, a good, efficient, able, and obviously corrupt, um, you know, FSB person in Yekaterinburg or Blagoveshchensk or whatever, you know your chances of getting to Moscow are minimal. So why not make advan take advantage of what you've got, you know, marry the mayor's daughter, make sort of, you know, deals with your friends. You are meant to be there as Moscow's enforcer, mm. but in practice, you are if just you part of this cover. If you can't get away, then you, you um, yeah. have roots. Uh, you create roots in the... Again, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting... It's, again, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this is why the system's going to collapse next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think actually collapse Wednesday? is likely. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is it. I mean, so I'm not saying Wednesday. So Tuesday or Thursday, on the other hand, you know. Okay. But, but the point is, again, this is, this is what I see about this kind of grinding down of the system. It's, it's, it's capacity to do the things it wants to do um, becoming less and less. And now a regime like that can survive a long time. In many ways, look, when, when Prime Minister Stalipin was assassinated, I think from that point, basically, Tsarist Russia was brain dead. But like most dinosaurs, with a tiny little brain on the end of a long, long neck, it may well have taken a long time to realise it was dead. It still managed to last through three years of World War I, which was a much more catastrophic systemic blow than the current special military operation. So, you know, the, but it these did not take place on, on Russian territory, it was far away. It took a lot of manpower and a lot of resources out of the country, but it didn't devastate the country itself. Well, no, I mean, the, the war didn't, but in some ways, precisely the efforts to feed the voracious more, you know, the increasingly when conscription would basically be that a ring of soldiers would surround a village and everyone between the ages of 15 and 50 would be marched off. That, I mean, that's as devastating in its own way as actually being caught in the middle of a free fire zone. Right. Uh, it's an interesting thing, this, uh, what you say about rotation and about the FSB, because it reminds me of the lack of other career lifts, even those that are publicly proclaimed, like, you know, this, this slogan that the new elite is being forged on the new territories. They are now called, they were called Nova Territory, the territories that have joined themselves. Like, by an accident, evidently. Um, so, присоединившиеся территории uh, are, again, proclaimed to be some sort of training ground for the new elites, and you cannot hope for a career rise unless you go there and stay there for some time. And we had a few examples of people 
again, not the local people, of course. The system is still its, its conservative self, and it hates outsiders. So no one of the heroes of Donbass, the heroes of the Russian Spring, etc., they're mostly dead. And those who are lucky to be alive have no career rise whatsoever. But Kiryanka's people are trained at the governor's school in my former academy, the, the Ranepa of blessed memory. Uh, they go to Luhansk for some three months in one case, and then they come back, but where? One of these uh, guys is now the head of Chukotka, not the most enviable of positions. Uh, another, I think, is planned for, uh, again, one of, one of the poorest of, of um, uh, Chuvashia, the Republic of, of Chuvashia. Um, but regions like, I'm not speaking of Moscow, St. Petersburg, but something better like Samara, Nizhny Novgorod, Saratov, um, Bashkartostan, Tatarstan, etc., or even the Far Eastern territories. They are not up for grabs because they are already occupied. And what the system has already done is to uh, delete the provision about two terms in a row uh, about the governors. So now governors, heads of regions, can serve as many terms as they like. So that's why Sabatin is, you'll be surprised to hear, is running for mayor of Moscow again. He has personally handed the documents to the Electoral Commission. I think it was either yesterday or uh, today. So again, I, I'm sharing the good news with you in case you are anxious. So there is no space at the top. And the war, which like a revolution, should be 100,000 vacancies, is not making any vacancies at all. Some generals are being killed. Maybe that makes for some uh, career steps for the subordinates. I just haven't heard it. I uh, haven't heard about it. But otherwise, you see, the system is trying to achieve revolutionary scale changes while preserving its nature. It will not even let any new people sit at the table. Are we, maybe we're missing something. Have you noticed any, any new faces in the Security Council, for example? No? Sad. But then, speaking of the new elites, we have the war correspondents. They are being invited to the Kremlin. Isn't it grand? No, no enthusiasm whatsoever. No, at all. No. no. They are not even being appointed uh, to replace the old Konstantin Ernst, which would have been a very natural step when we come to think of it. Those revolutionary bards, those singers of blood and soil, those Edinburghs and whatever, Simonovs of the new era, how are they uh, rewarded for all their... All the fire of their souls, how? One, mm, one of the most fiery ones has been killed by, with his own portrait that exploded. Uh, after that, I've been very uh, cautious of receiving presents at my own public speeches. Uh, so I feel for, I feel for, for him, really. But we, they, they did yeah. actually, but they, they got an audience with Vladimir Putin, which let's be perfectly honest, many uh, key figures within the state actually have trouble um, sort of securing the, these days. But okay, I'm just conscious that, that soon we have to open this up, up for questions. So you seem a little bit un, sort of uncomfortable with my vision of this sort of growing dysfunctionality. Mm -hmm. So where do you think this goes? What do I think? Where do you think this goes? I mean, assuming, again, Putin sadly seems to be in robust enough health that he can survive. The economy is not going to kind of collapse imminently. Mm -hmm. Um, the war may go terribly, but it's not the kind of war that is going to see Ukrainian tanks sweeping into Moscow. Um, so in some ways, the, sort of the, the big deus ex machina options are, are, are let's say, are, are off the table. Mm -hmm. Where do you think two years, four years from now, Russia will, the system will be? If we look at the body politic, the system as a body, and try to determine which parts of it are healthy, and which are less so. I would say that, well, we have troubles with, with the head, definitely. <laughs> um, we have a very sad lack of political leadership, actual political leadership, determining the goals and telling other parts what to do to achieve those goals. But uh, what are the healthy bits? The healthy bits, in my opinion, are um, 
financial economic bloc, central bank, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Economic Development, uh, all those less public advisors to the president and people who invent gray import schemes and other ways to circumvent the sanctions. Um, plus, a more or less market economy that Russia enjoys, the business. Not, the, not perhaps the big business totally dependent on the state, but not, not the Rottenberg and Timchenko type of business, but medium and low level business, which is keeping the country well fed and dressed and served so the Russians can preserve the illusion of nothing much actually happening. So their lifestyles have not changed drastically. We are the most adaptable of nations. Uh, we can adapt to things that we should not be adapting to. Um, so we are really good at that. This is the healthy part. Another part which seems to me to be healthy is, well, in a sense functional, is civic bureaucracy. The government in general, uh, the regional administrations, People like Sabanian, people like all the Nikitins heading all the Novgorods uh, in Russia. Uh, even, even this poor guy, Gladkov, he's evidently trying to, to do something. Uh, municipalities, yes, and regional administrations. These seem to be, again, preventing the country from an actual administrative collapse. This is the thing we noticed again during the pandemic with which we see so many parallels. We had one million excess mortality in a year, which is huge, but we have not seen a collapse either on the administrative level or in the healthcare system. It was not the case that, well, hospitals were closed, dead bodies lying on the corridor, no ambulance coming when you call for it. It was coming, maybe slower at some regions, quicker, but it was coming, it had some sort of medicines, it was trying again to, to do its, its job in a varyingly decent manner. It, the same may be affirmed currently about the generalized Russia management system. The worst parts, the, the parts that fare worse, are, as I said, political leadership, the military, military intelligence, secret services in the part, in that part where they should be preventing terrorist attacks and diversione group from entering the territory, but pretty good in the part where they have to repress internal dissent, hunt down female theater. Uh, conductors, uh, it, this they do with, with great bravery and, and efficiency. Um, the courts are obedient. There have been no cases of dissent in any part of this internal repressive system. It's no good against the actual enemy, but it's pretty good against one's own people. So this is the state we are in. And I wanted to paint this picture in order to attempt to come back to, to come closer to answering your question. How long will this functionality hold? If we rule out what you call Deus Ex Machina events or the black swans in more popular terminology. Well, we are a big country, it's a big system, and we should not underestimate the power of inertia. What I think we may more or less safely affirm is that its development is going in one direction. It is not getting younger. It is not attracting talent. It is not creating alliances. Um, I do not see that. And the leadership is certainly not getting any healthier or younger either. So maybe the question of timing is at once crucial because if this lasts for like 10 more years, there is hope of educating a whole generation of young people in this new isolationist, isolationist anti-Western militarized environment and then kind of jumping over from the generation of 70 plus to the generation of, well, people born in 2004 to 2014 when we had relatively high birth rates, so it's, it's a sizable strata, it's bigger than the young people of today. So if the system survives, survives long enough to kind of transplant itself as a kind of parasitical worm is being transplanted 
into the brains and muscle of this younger generation, then it may hope for continued lifespan, even if the actual people symbolizing the present system die out. So timing is at once important and, again, at the same time, I think, inessential because I do not really see any great likelihood of rejuvenation, reinvigoration, strengthening of the system. Even in the most uh, enthusiastic rants of the Z channels or state TV propaganda, we hardly see any scenario of Russia emerging stronger described. The best case scenario they can paint is the one of Russia surviving this onslaught of uni unified forces of NATO and then the gays. Uh, so if we manage to preserve our values, if we manage to guard, as you say, the Red Square from NATO tanks manned by Ukrainians, then this may be some sort of a victory. No one is even speaking, at least I haven't heard anyone speaking about some sort of bright future in which Russia is stronger and more esteemed in the world and its people live better than they used to live before the war. Yeah, that's true enough. I mean, I, I, I agree with you about actually the, the, the healthiness versus the unhealthiness. Um, the interesting thing, I mean, the, the, the healthy parts really are the technocracy mm -hmm. as opposed to the autocracy. And again, I think this for me is one of the sort of real sharp divisions is that, you know, what is Russia? And the answer is it, it is a, a strange hybrid regime. Usually in the past, hybrid means democratic, sort of forms of democracy married to autocracy. In this case, it's actually, it's, it's this challenge between an autocratic regime that feels just by decree and by heroic goal, it can somehow shape the universe. That basically, you know, an, an ukaz ought to kind of take precedence over gravity. And technocrats who just basically are just doing their best. And I, I mean, this has been such a, a sort of a, a key theme, I would say, not just of during the war, or even during the war and during the pandemic for, for a long time. I mean, I, mean, I don't know if, if, if people have had the joy of having, if they're going to Russia back when, I mean, since, since June of last year, I have been banned as a, the rabid Russophobe that I am. But um, going to Russia, and if you're not staying in a hotel or similar, if you're staying with someone, and then you have to go and do the full registration, residence registration thing, you which involves that? oh, which involves a ridiculous amount of paperwork. What a law-abiding person you are! I find that because of the sorts of things I look at, it behoves me to be very, very careful about crossing every T and dotting every I, so as not to give them an excuse. Um, but anyway, you have to go and do that, and it, it include like the person you're staying with has to bring their their um, documents to prove they actually own the property, that kind of thing. Ridiculous and frankly pointless, but nonetheless a sort of massive inconvenience. But on the other hand now, especially in Moscow, but it's, it's also spread elsewhere, there was this whole network of kind of moi documenti, multifunctional centres. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you go there and you know, you, you take a, you, you, you'd say which particular government service you, you want and you take a little number and soon enough you would, you would go to, to, to this sort of the booth and there'll be in this case someone from the interior ministry who would be on the whole not the cheeriest and most jovial of people. Um, but on the other hand they would actually usually be incredibly helpful. And what was a ridiculously onerous task is made into merely irksome. And for me, almost that encapsulated modern Russia. There is a, a, a pointless um, inheritance in terms of a sort of you know, requirements, which really ought to just simply be scrapped. Well, we're not going to scrap it, but we will find ways of making it a bit less of a pain in the backside. We'll digitalize it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, and, and, and look, I'm, I'm all in favor, because the point is, this is, this is precisely on the kind of petty level where autocracy and the habits of a tradition and a paranoid security state collide with a technocracy that just wants to just sort things out and make things just work as well as possible. I mean, while probably in, enriching themselves at the same time um, we, for the people at the top of the system. In, in some sort of Chinese autocratic country? Well, you might, I see, this, I put my faith in kleptocracy. 
in this respect. My view is precisely that, you know, if you look at, you know, Putin and the people around him, people who are his ideological closest com com companions, they're all pretty much in the age, age range of 68 to 74. Most of them are ex-KGB, but also almost all of them were not members of old nomenclatura families. They were not born into the privilege, such as it was of Soviet times. They were the first one. They hadn't made, they, they were the ones in their family to make it. And that was it. They, they'd made the big time. They were in the Soviet nomenclatura, and then the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, and, and I think there is an element of sort of resentment and bitterness that's metastasized from what have we lost to who took it from us. The West is the convenient uh, sort of scapegoat. In part, look, we also did some seriously bad sort of political moves in the 1990s and other times as well. So, but nonetheless, the, the, the point is that I don't get the same sense of genuine personal animus from the next political generation, the ones you say could be sort of leapfrogged. Um, instead, look, they are pragmatic, ruthless kleptocrats. In some cases, just doing their jobs, as long as doing their jobs also allow them to enrich themselves substantially on the side. No one wants to live by their salary alone, to use that Georgian curse. Um, but the thing is, these are people who have every incentive to fix relations with the West. I mean, this is my hope, you see. I'm thinking, banning me, very, one of the only times I've ever been on the same list as Piers Morgan. Um, <laughs> Banning me is an entirely trivial and pointless thing. It was just a bit of sort of tit for tat. I mean, if I was, if I had any marketing now, I would sell myself as the man Putin fears. Um, but alas, I can't quite bring myself to that. Which is another reason why I shouldn't be on the same list as Piers Morgan. Um, but the point is, actually unbanning me is the kind of totally trivial act, which nonetheless in the West, because particularly in Europe. You know, we, we, we desperately want to sort of pretend that things are getting better. Mm -hmm. um, would, would be regarded as a sort of great move of liberalisation. So it wouldn't take much for the next political generation to actually improve relations with the West because they want to get back to the good old days when they could steal at home, bank and spend abroad, buy their um, you know, charming pads in Knightsbridge, send their kids to American universities, anchor their yachts safely off the French and Italian coast, send their mistresses to, to shop in Milan, all that kind of stuff, which they can't do at the moment. Sochi is very nice, but it's Dubai. not the same. They can go to Dubai, precisely. And I'm sure Dubai is very nice. I'm not sure. But <laughs> there you go. I, I, I'm a naturally generous soul. Plus, I'm hoping for sponsorship from the Dubai Tourist Board. Um, but, you know, these, these are people for whom the current situation off, offers, offers few gains. My hope is that precisely the regime does not manage that leapfrog, ma does not manage to kind of inc create a new generation, the same way as, you know, the Civil War generation was core to Stalin's rise. Mm -hmm. um, but instead, the power of courtesy of mortality slips into the hands of, of, of these cynical people who actually, for the cynicism, will want to improve relations with the outside world. And also, and this is the interesting thing about kleptocracies, once you've stolen everything that's nailed down, you then want to legalize it because you want to be able to give it to your kids or other successors without you know, essentially them having to fight the same way you do. And in many cases, and I've, I've heard this from people who are not oligarchs, but, but minigarchs, um, who look at their pampered offspring and don't believe they could fight the way that they had fought in the 1990s or whatever. So rule of law can begin to creep in for the most self-interested of reasons. And last point I will make, you can have rule of law without democracy. You can't have democracy without rule of law. And this was, for me, one of the big mistakes of the 1990s in Russia which is an attempt to kind of bring in democracy without rule of law. Rule of law without democracy? But how do you get uh, the courts? Well, you get courts. It's just that the courts are not actually courts. They are places where judgments which have been decreed elsewhere are announced. They but are that's not podium. Rule of law. Pardon? That's not rule of law. No, exactly. I mean, so, so, so actually you, you, you have a, a, a sham. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe people actually might have their own reasons for making it less of a sham. But then again, maybe I'm just an inveterate optimist. I think we should go to, I can, I can see Dennis with his microphone, so maybe we should actually move to questions now. Thank you. 
my question is, so usually you're considered to be the voice of optimist for Russia. And a few days ago, you were repeating how it's not, in, it's not correct to draw historical parallels between Putin and Hitler, current Russia, and what happened with Germany in the 1930s. After that, however, you said that maybe it is more correct to compare current Russian situation to what happened to Germany after the World War I, when Germany was defeated, poor, and full of hatred. Could you clarify, do you really think that Russia can become, in the future, sort of nation that could, instead of, after Putin, instead of electing Navalny, could potentially elect another Hitler? And uh, thinking about how, what role the European governments played in that, what should be done by the European governments to prevent that in the future? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I must declare myself still an enemy to historical parallels. They show similarities which do not reflect the differences brought by the passage of time, and these are the only that are important. So we clutch at similarities. They appeal to our sense of harmony. But really thinking in repetitions, in cycles, in... Uh, uh, Maitnik, whatever, historical Kaliya, the historical, how would you call it, road. Uh, this is just a metaphor, and it's a very bad basis for actually making decisions. This is not analysis. This is just your, your imagination at work. But still, historical parallels may be of some use to show to demonstrate certain political mechanisms at work. What I me meant, and continue to mean, with this parallel of the current Russian situation with the First World War, and I'm not the only one doing the comparison, it's quite in your face, actually, is this. Yes, we have had a lot of Hitlering floating around, uh, and even Godwin, the author of the law of Godwin prohibiting to use Hitler in any discussion, has, I think, um, in the beginning of, of the war, he has posted on his Twitter the picture <laughs> of the Russian president saying, you won't believe whom this guy resembles me of. <laughs> so if Godwin himself breaks the law of Godwin, then all is allowed. Um, but... With all the horror and bloodshed we're experiencing at the moment, it is certainly remarkable that the leadership that started this bloody war and the strata mainly supporting it is aged 60 plus. This is quite unusual because war should be supported by the young who actually do the fighting and who can make careers and uh, become new Napoleons, etc. It is not appealing, it should not be appealing to the elderly who, in fairness, should be more conservative. Uh, but Hitler, the real Hitler, was the idol of the new generation. He was supported by intellectuals, by the university circles, by the city dwellers, by the large and small uh, businessmen. And he was, as I said, particularly popular with the young people. And there's this term in um, Germany history studies, uncompromising generation. Uncompromising generation are the people born in the beginning of the 20th century, those who have not served in the First World War themselves, but who were younger brothers and sons of those who did. They were not the Nazi leadership. But they were the pressure from below radicalizing the Nazi party, pushing it to more and more extreme measures, because they grew up in the atmosphere of national humiliation, poverty, defeat, etc. They were the main supporters of the idea that Germany was betrayed, stabbed in the back, because there's no other way to explain why we, the Germany, we have lost the war their fathers and their elder brothers had personal experiences of this warfare, so they may have known a thing or two about how this war was actually fought and lost and for what reasons. But they were dead for the most part. So this uncompromising generation has risen to carry Hitler on their shoulders, basically. 
I have already mentioned these 10 years of relatively high birth rates that Russia has enjoyed under the golden Putin years. It was 2004, 2014, or some demographers say 2006, 2016. Then due to economic growth, Materinsky capital and other social measures introduced by the government and general sense of stability, people started to have more children. I myself was one of the number. Uh, my uh, fertility spree exactly is exactly covered by, by, this, <laughs> by this period. Uh, so, you know, statistics, they sometimes apply to individual cases as well. So, we have very little young people born in the 90s, which was a birth, um, low birth uh, rates period, youth gap. We are having this uh, gap approximately every 25 years. This is the direct um, reflection of enormous demographic losses of the first half of the 20th century. The echo of, of the war, of communist regime, of uh, uh, collectivization, etc. Some wounds will not be healed. So every 25 years we have this gap. But during those 10 to 12 years, we had, as I repeat, relatively high birth rate. Higher than before, higher than after. So I'm thinking of these people. I'm thinking of people who, the eldest of, the, of them are already 18. The youngest are, well, seven. When I say if regime has 10 more years, I'm thinking of them. And this is my main, yes, my main fear for the future is this. If these people, if this generation is allowed to grow up in isolation, poverty, ignorance, propaganda, monopoly of the information sphere, they will possibly give birth to or support a leader of resentment, the real one, not the one invented by Konstantin Ernst and his first channel. They have invented it all with the help of this Stare uh, Pesnia Glavnam, etc. They have in implemented nostalgia for the Soviet Union, which was there, but it was not widespread, it was not universal. But if you tell people for 20 years that the main tragedy of their lives was the collapse of the Soviet Union, in time they will believe it. Individual memory is actually a privilege. Not everyone is entitled to have individual memory. There are many very sad looking psychological experiments in which people repeat scenes from movies as something that actually happened to themselves. If you do not have the habit of reflection, if you do not have the habit of frankly intellectual work or just reading long texts, your memories will be dictated to you. So, this is how you implant a resentment, but in 10 years' times, in 15 years' times, we may have the real one, based on actual political and economic circumstances in which these young people find themselves. The last part of your question was about the uh, European governments and the world governments and what can they do. I'm not the one to give advice to anyone, much less to other countries' governments. I tried it with my own government, and it was not much of a success. <laughs> um, but what I can see, both as a political scientist and as a citizen of, of my country, is this. Whatever steps lead to isolation lead to stronger authoritarian tendencies and therefore aggression. This is a very simple, very evident correlation. I understand the temptation to isolate the country that is so unpredictable and so aggressive at times, but I'm afraid it is a counter-effective, although understandably attractive tactic. Isolation leads to an autocratic government within the country, and it just plants seeds for future aggression. If I can just add just two quick points to that. I mean, Personally, I, I would give that generation a little bit more agency. I mean, we should remember, after all, that the Soviet and Soviet-style regimes had even more control over the, the inputs in, in, into sort of how people think and how people frame themselves and consider their relationship to, to their society. And yet these regimes still collapse very quickly. I mean, things of East Germany, uh, which on one level seemed to be like a, almost a sort of Soviet theme park, the Soviet Union that the Soviets would wish, Soviet leadership, would wish they had, and yet 
it collapsed with, 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 with striking ease. So one, one can hope that human beings can, can still be sort of um, sufficiently but uh, Soviet, able to say... But when Soviet regime just evinced the first signs of its weakness, the outside world just rushed in to integrate, to feed, to entertain, to involve Russian uh, Soviet leadership at that time and then Soviet people into the common family of humanity if we will have intentional policies of isolating the country. No, I, I, this is, on that I, I would agree with you entirely and I think one of the things that, that does bother me is you know, we, we, we have the entirely understandable sort of mantras of this war continues until you know, Putin must realize that he has failed and such like. What I'm really not seeing amidst all the discussion about how one ma maintains the support for Ukraine and such like is any real Western vision for a relationship with Russia for end of war plus one month, end of war plus one year, and so forth. Because when it comes down to it, fine, bring Ukraine into NATO and so forth. Give it whatever security guarantees, whatever kit it wants, and such like. Ultimately, the best security guarantee for Ukraine, and indeed for Europe as a whole, is a happy, prosperous, stable Russia that accepts that its neighbors have a right to exist in their own sovereignty. Now, that's... That's not an easy ask. It's a lot easier just to send some tanks. Um, but nonetheless, absolutely, isolation is precisely what will stop that and ensure that there will be a border of hostility somewhere in Eastern Europe. Thank you so much. Ekaterina, I want to ask you a question. I'm so nervous. I will try to do um, thank you so much for your mention, for your amazing energy and your amazing mind. And my question also about Germany a little bit. <laughs> um, can I sit? Um, thank you. So my question is, we are all agree Putin is corrupt. But uh, my question is about can be Putin corrupt a uh, little bit earlier, and maybe he was corrupt in Dresden, <laughs> in Germany, because when he was come back to um, USSR, when USSR collapsed, he was open first international bank in Russia, and name of the bank was Dresdener Bank. It's Wikipedia. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, I'm not sure. I'm just asking because I'm really interested. And um, then he was like uh, dancing in Austrian weddings, uh, in Austrian prime minister. And then he invited uh, German ex-Kanzler um, Gerhard Schröder to um, Gazprom, working in Moscow. And um, Germany was disagreed when George Bush was invited to Ukraine in 2008 to join NATO. And um, Putin's daughter have a lot of connection with, uh, for example, like one of the um, one of the one of the her his daughter is have a relationship with guy from Munich, and another daughter was have relationship with guy from Gaga. So, what is the question? My question, I'm sorry, yes, my question, uh, maybe um, Putin... Is a German spy. Yes. <laughs> that, that's definitely your thing, Mark. Okay, you thank you so it? much. No, 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 it was a question to you. I would entirely hand that to one of you. And I will just sit back and relax. <laughs> that's very unkind of you. Uh, I don't know anything about it, really. Uh, but there's one thing I know, and it has already been mentioned here, that's about the Democratic Republic of Germany as an ideal for Soviet leadership, and especially the ideal for the current Russian leadership as well. You can almost sense it, not in the things they say, but in the actual model they are building. So perhaps the memories of a happy life in Dresden actually influenced Russia's fate in a much more important way than any case of petty corruption, and it must have been petty at, at that time of his career. 
Because look at Gadeir. What was it like? It was, it had a multi-party parliament. I think it had five parties in a parliament. It had no um, deficit of the humiliating kind that Soviet Union had. It had order. It was clean, kind of nice looking. And it was not even governed by a party. Not like the Communist Party was the center of power, but, but by Stasi. One of the most horrible secret police services, even as compared to, well, it's a hard competition. But I think Stasi wins the, the palm. They had their own particular little methods. Uh, I think there's a long and nasty German word for it. Uh, the methods they used to basically drive the dissidents crazy by coming to their apartments, changing things there, like Amelie did in, in the movie, but in a less comic way. And of course, by telling someone that someone else is a, a secret police informant. KGB did that to uh, Soviet dissidents at home as well, but Stasi developed this into, raised this into the art level. So the point was to gaslight a person, to make him or her tell things to his or her surrounding which would uh, convince those people that their comrade or their loved one is going crazy, and even to have convinced the person himself or herself that something must be wrong with me. Because who on earth will really come secretly to my apartment to change the, the, the color of my towels in the bathroom? They did that. Or to move the clocks backward. So this was the thing that quite probably warned the admiration of young Vladimir. Look. No bloodshed, no violence, no heavy-handed work, but just intellectual warfare, and what a success. So what these elderly guys evidently imagine as their ideal of political development is, I think, that this Gadea. And now that I'm living in Germany, I must say that when you come to the eastern parts of Berlin, there's still a particular heavy, I would not say horror, but something undescribable hanging in the air. The very architecture, it's very Soviet looking. Um, I was recently on Karl Marx Allee, and it's tit for tat, it's Leninsky Prospect. When you stand there, you can almost imagine where the, the statue of Gagarin is, and when you walk down, the, there will be the Oktoberskaya metro station, etc. It's Exactly like this, but with something added, with some impression of hopeless durability. I don't know how to express it otherwise, which seems to me to be a particularly uh, Eastern Germany thing. If you want an, an impression of this, uh, there's a charming American comedy called The Top Secret. It's, it's totally absurd, and I find it very funny. Uh, the plot is uh, American pop singer coming to an, an unnamed but evidently an Eastern Germany type country. The style and the atmosphere are, I think, very well conveyed. I have to confess, I, I rather like Eastern Berlin, um, but I suppose it just says probably terrible things about me. The only thing I would actually add is we really must not forget the astonishing mediocrity of Putin's time in Dresden. I mean, you know, we have, we have had you know, the chance to see some of his personnel records, and he was at best a solid B. Um, he was not a, an agent runner, he was not liaising with terrorists, he was basically just rooting documents. He was a glorified file clerk more than anything else. Um, so yes, it may well be that his connections then later became useful, but I don't think anyone would have been looking at Vladimir Putin in Dresden and thinking, I must cultivate this chap, because one day he's going to be a bigwig. A lot of Russians nowadays uh, find themselves longing coming back home. Uh, and Ekaterina, uh, what would be the signs, markers, or triggers that would uh, make you consider coming back? Oh, I'll use the first opportunity. <laughs> ah, but frankly speaking, I'm afraid we cannot go back under the current leadership. 
You know, I do not like to come down to personalities. I remember I was once introduced to a group of German students coming to uh, Moscow as the only Russian political scientist who never mentions Putin's name. <laughs> I heard it, and I thought, hmm, there's something about it. Uh, I generally prefer to refer to people by their job titles rather than by their names. But in this case, I am afraid, I'm very much afraid, that with the president remaining president, we cannot hope for any solid political change, or at least any surface political change which will justify us in coming back. Because what's the point of coming back? Nostalgia is all very well, but it's emotional. We can live with that. Other generations of Russians have lived with that. But we can only come back if there's a chance of being able to work. That's what it boils down to. If you can do your work, it may be uncomfortable, partly dangerous, but if it's possible, then you have to, because you have a duty to your country. It may not be, at that moment, a safe country to take the children to, but for those of us who have social positions, uh, public positions, to whom, as the Soviet phrase is, the motherland has given an education, so we have a duty. But in order to realize this duty, we have to have a certain space for actions. So I would say that change of leadership is necessary and then some sign, just a little sign, like maybe um, eliminating the foreign agents legislation, that would be a nice first step. Letting out political prisoners would be a immensely symbolic and at the same time a very practical thing for any successor to do during his first honeymoon days. Um, I, would not, I would not comply a long list, a rider uh, of, of the things that you will have to show me in order for me to even contemplate coming back. You know that at the slightest opportunity we'll all come running barefoot in the direction of the border, of course. But at least some, some steps in, that will show that Upon coming, we won't be arrested immediately. We'll be able to do something useful for, for the country, for the people, that is necessary. You know that by current federal legislation, I'm legally forbidden to teach. There's a law about it. So with all my feelings, whatever feelings I might have, even if I won't be arrested immediately, there's just a question, what, what am I supposed to do if I do come back? Um, and thank you very much for coming to London. So for me, this kind of an event is an attempt, even for a very short period of time, to feel back in a Russian context you lose when you leave the country. So the question is how to reconcile and, and balance the need to integrate into the society. Uh, you intend to live in at least for several years and desire to preserve your identity and your culture, especially when your main occupation has nothing to do with Russia or Russian studies, or, and you feel completely lost in, in the middle of everything. <laughs> Thank ah, you. Do you really have to read Tchaikovsky to your kids at night in order for them to preserve their cultural identity? Uh, you know what? These questions are by no means unique. The situation is not unique. Generation after generation has experienced immigration, voluntary or enforced. Generations of emigrants have faced the same questions. We need to integrate, our children need to integrate, but at the same time, we want to remain who we are. Various people have answered this challenge in various ways. I'm not sure I'm even competent to speak about it. My, of course, favorite model as always, is Vladimir Vladimirovich Nabokov. Um, he used to write about, in Russian, and about Russian subjects, about Russian heroes, for many years of his life in Europe. He did not dream to become a German writer, or either to stop being a writer and to, to do something else. But when he emigrated again to United States, he started, even a little earlier, he started to write in English. 
and he achieved glory and recognition and well, wealth by writing English novels. Uh, there's a, usually an impression in Russian readership that his English novels are somehow inferior uh, to his Russian ones. That is not true at all. They are just more difficult to read if you don't have enough English. But he did rise to new levels of creativity. So my point is, we cannot all be writers of genius, although we may try. Um, but my point is this. I think the center of our identity is, after all, our profession. Language is important. Books we read are important. Circles we move in are very important. But we are adult people in doing what we do. So this, I think, is the core. I know other people base their identities on something else. For example, they say, I'm, I don't know, the father of the family or Russian patriot or whatever. But for me, the, the central thing has always been your work. So that is what makes us, well, social creatures. This is what makes us grow. This is what makes us develop. And at the same time, it makes us useful to our fellow creatures, without which our lives are pretty useless as well. I think we are blessed in the way the previous emigrants were not blessed. We may call ourselves emigrants, not relicants, in having internet. I can't now even imagine what those people 100 years ago had to live through. No connection with the country, maybe letters coming once in a few months, censorship, no travel, absolutely new alien environment, no Google Translate, no Google Maps. How they survived at all is a mystery to me. Many have not. The level of suicides among the, the first Russian immigration was notoriously high, and that is very understandable. But we have our social environment in our smartphones. So let us first count our blessings and be thankful that we have, subjected, we have been subjected to this enforced relocation in this age, not 100 years before. But there is a difference, surely, in the sense that the wave of emigres that followed 1917 were not expected to expatiate upon Bolshevik Russia and its crimes. Likewise, the people who got out of the Soviet Union later, they were welcomed precisely as you know, disciples of freedom who had wanted to break away from, from this nasty, repressive communist beast. But it seems to me, and I, I, I say this uh, you know, as an outsider and as an observer, that today there is a great sort of uh, moral imperative that says, well, if you're a Russian, you must demonstrate that you have, uh, you know, that, that, that you are fully in, opposed to this current regime, or else you're a bad Russian. I mean, there, there is this sense of a good and bad Russian, um, which I, I don't think we saw. I mean, to, to a degree, we saw with certain sort of Germans. In, certainly in Britain in, in, in the sort of late 30s and early 40s. But in the main, if we think of the Russian um, you know, emigre waves, they didn't face this. They had pretty bad reputation, as migrants always have. For example, in France, uh, there was the infamous case of a Russian emigre killing a French prime minister, a French president. Uh, and then there was a general scare that they, they will all be deported. They were not looked upon favorably by, not always looked upon favorably by the societies they forced themselves upon. But yes, I agree that this shared moral responsibility is a new thing at this historical moment. It was not there before. Although, you, you should demonstrate that you are opposed to the regime. If I were not opposed to the regime, why should I be here? I could have stayed at home with much more profit and comfort. But of course, because Russia has been infiltrating Europe and America for two decades, uh, the Russians outside of Russia are not always political emigres, but kleptocrats much more often. And it is so unfair that the further south you come in Europe, 
the more of those kleptocrats you meet, and at the same time, the more Russia-friendly the environment becomes. In Italy or in Spain, no one is bothering to ask you whether you support Ukrainian forces or not. They are terrorizing you with that in the Baltic countries for self-evident reasons, in Poland, here in England, to a less extent in Germany and France. But in Spain, which has been bought wholesale, whole, you know, stretchers of land belong to not just Russians, but people who have enriched themselves in being civil servants, oligarchs, etc., military. Uh, secret services officials, they have been buying villas, they have been sending their families and second families and third families there, and no one is asking them any moral questions whatsoever. That's the usual unfairness of things. <laughs> ah, that's the phrase that every speaker is eager to hear. <laughs> Hi, both. Um, thank you very much for your speech and uh, for everything that you do. Uh, my question is uh, about the upcoming election and what, what, what's happening during the war. Um, it seems that the war does not bring any good news for, for the government. Do you feel that the war will be suppressed from the public discourse in the next months? And do you feel it will have effect on the actual front? Thank you. Uh, the war to be suppressed in, or at least minimized in public discourse in order to make way for the usual stability-based election campaign. That's a good question. I'm thinking about it a lot, and I'm also seeing some legislative changes in our electoral legislation, which seem to me to tend to demonstrate several things. First, the system wants elections in place it wants still to retain the vestiges of electoral legitimacy. There were elections in 2022, original elections, they went pretty smoothly, no one paid much attention to them. There will be a set of quite important election campaigns in 2023, including the one in Moscow, also in, in a number of other regions, and of course, to crown it all, we are going to have if things go on as they are, we are going to have presidential elections in March 2024. Not that much time is left. So the system wants elections. It is also very much in doubt whether it can trust actual voters, so it tries to replace them with electronic ones. Uh, the experiment with electronic voters has been considered successful, so the practice will be implemented on a larger scale. We are going to have three days voting. We are also having legislative changes which allow elections to be held on territories with uh, martial law. So the imaginary inhabitants of imaginary Russian regions, of which we have four, will vote during presidential elections. How many of them are there is known to no one. Where those regions are situated is also a mystery. But these people, whoever they are, will distinctly cast their votes in favor of the incumbent. So the system wants elections. The system is afraid of its actual people. It is devising ways to circumvent the possible dissatisfaction of the electorate in still managing the elections more or less in the old way. Uh, I agree with the question uh, that, with what was implied in the question, that war, actually, I think we can say that now, is not that popular. People are not enthusiastic about it at all. So that's why the president, with such, I would say, tragic or comic insistence, is trying to normalize it. He's trying to pretend that everything is going according to plan, and you should not really, really be paying that much attention to it. In this, He's very much in harmony with the people, because if we look at the polls, for example, Levada is asking people every month uh, what noteworthy events happened during last month. The most popular answer ever is nothing. <laughs> Absolutely, it's like 30 plus percent. Second most popular answer, uh, something that private, something that happened to me and my family, family affairs. And starting the third place, we get something 
of actual, well, political or military or social nature. So the percentage of people who name something that is connected to or related to the special military operation is going down steadily. Also, the percentage of people who say that they are watching closely or just watching or following what is happening there. So I can perceive how the whole energy of the Russian people is being spent in closing their eyes as tight as possible. So the nation is busy being in denial. I do think that political machine is sensing that because it also wants to be in denial. It's the only way to be even comparatively comfortable or at least to be in a less intolerable position. So I think that they do need something that can be sold to the people as some sort of victory, even a temporary victory, and they need something to turn away from, to turn to from this war news which are no longer of interest to the people and which actually irritate the people. How they will manage it is another question. What I'm describing is the intent, some sort of election plan. I'm not sure that it's actually doable, although I am sure that the election machine itself will produce the necessary result. But one last thing we need to know about authoritarian elections is that, unlike in a democracy, where the result is unpredictable, but consequences are predictable, you cannot exactly tell who will win, but you can tell what will happen in each case. In an autocracy, it's the other way around. Results are predictable, but, but consequences are not. It's one thing to come up with a necessary figure the morning after elections. It's another to make society accept it. And what happens when society does not accept it? We saw in 2020 in Belarus, the textbook case. Authoritarian elections going wrong. It may be the case of Russia in 2024. Then again, it may not, because autocracies learn from each other. And Russian one has certainly learned, I think, from the Belarusian example, in not allowing any Tikhanovskaya's on the electoral field. So I don't know whom they will select as competitors, but the usual scheme is called by political technologists the Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. So you have to have a Snow White, the princess, the incumbent, and then you have to have your set of, well, dwarves. They have to be not just harmless, but they have to be pathetic, <laughs> pitiful, comic looking. It's not easy to choose, but uh, because you cannot always judge whether that or this person is just ugly enough not to appeal to the electorate, but I hope they will they will manage it. They have managed it so far. I mean, we may well yet still have that role for Prigozhin as, uh, as no, someone who... No, they, they want, I, they want there. No, I mean, I think it's Too unlikely. Dangerous. But just, just, just a sort of last point. I mean, the, the question about how the war affects the elections is obviously in, in, entirely legitimate, and, and I, I absolutely agree that from the, the regime's point of view, unless there is some unexpected and easy victory in Ukraine, which I'm not anticipating, they will be wanting to sort of tone it down. But one should also think about actually how the elections affect the war. I mean, if one looks at, for example, mobilization, I mean, there's a lot of pressure from within the military saying we need another mobilization because we're going to take heavy casualties. We need to mobilize now so that we have the troops ready to fill the line when we suffer casualties. Putin, once again, is very unwilling to do that, and I suspect he's waiting until after the September elections because, you know, a mobilization wave would be very, very disruptive. We saw last time that more people fled the country twice as many people fled the country as actually got mobilized. So, you know, if, I mean, if he possibly can, he will want to sort of wait until late autumn before that. So again, there, there is an interesting kind of iterative process. But when it all comes down to it, you know, the, sort of the common denominator is, is Putin trying to minimize the amount of decisions he has to make and the Russian people have to make. Because they're all, you know, decisions are complex, irritating things, much easier to avoid them. If I ignore it, maybe it will go away. This is the new motto of the Russian Federation. Exactly. Thank you so much for Thank your you time. very much, Ekaterina and Mark. Thank you.
Спасибо, очень приятно.